This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on India Solar Capacity, Milestones and Challenges. The participants are Mukul Sawal, Environmentalist, and Sonu Sood, AIR Correspondent. With expanding energy needs in a rapidly growing world economy, energy transition from non-renewable to renewable energy has been a major thrust area worldwide. And International Solar Alliance, founded by Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2015, is a crucial step in that direction. International Solar Alliance's Fifth Assembly is all set to be held in New Delhi from 17th to 20th of October. Mukulji, can you tell us about the importance of energy transition and how does an initiative like International Solar Alliance provide impetus to energy transition? The National Solar Alliance is a treaty-based alliance, which means that there are 90 countries which have ratified the treaty and 109 countries have signed it. That's half the world. But most important, it is that part of the world which has almost no electricity. I'm not talking about renewable energy or solar energy, but no electricity whatsoever. Connection in the villages, for example. Take the case of renewable energy. Africa has just one percent, and they are in dire need of electrification. Now the question becomes: Is that there is a technological transformation going on, which is supporting the energy transition? And it so happens that this trans, the technology transition, is in what we would call sustainable energy or for sustainable development, because it is using natural forms of energy. We started with hydroelectricity, which is really water dropping down, uh, stored or with a dam or with a tunnel. Then there was a lot of potential of wind energy in Europe, particularly, and then came solar energy. For more for the tropical countries, but also United States, Europe, and China. The advantage of this transition is that the running costs are very, very low, almost maintenance costs. But it is technology intensive. It depends on silicon chips and newer forms of technology, whose price is also dropping because of the way technological advance is taking place and because of volumes of scale. We needed to bridge the suppliers. Or the producers of this new form of energy, and the consumers, or where the demand lay. And the importance of the Solar Alliance, initiated by the Prime Minister, set up in a tropical country, is that it, it can be that bridge that brings together these the producers and the consumers, and whose main focus is knowledge sharing, project preparation, and suggesting enabling activities. So essentially, the International Solar Alliance, like other treaty-based organizations, is not just for disbursing money, just for building consensus, bringing people together, but for sharing knowledge and experience. That I think is a very important innovation of the Prime Minister. A lot of what the developing countries, particularly Africa, lack, part of finances, and they cannot get technology because of the IPR restrictions or they don't have the capacity. But knowledge sharing. Can benefit them a lot, and you have agencies like the World Bank or the private sector who are giving money or technology. But then the, the, the poorer countries or countries who are not quite there in terms of technology and capacity do not have the experience to negotiate with them. For example, the International Solar Alliance went in for some kind of a global tender for photovoltaic panels, and they found that the cost in a global tender was almost half of what. Was being paid for by African countries. It's not that there was exploitation, but just because there will be a small demand in a particular country, the cost would be higher. Demand is aggregated, the cost come down, and you have a benchmark that if countries come together to place this order, or the World Bank facilitates a single order, or the International Solar Alliance prepares a project with a large number of countries involved, just as a catalyst, without providing the money or the technology itself, the price can come down. The price comes down, the economics changes, and with that, the cost of power becomes lower. Cost of servicing that loan becomes cheaper, and you get into virtuous cycle or circle where you can span this model with the experience that the country themselves gain, and people can benefit. So, sir, how self-sustaining is the use of solar energy? Is it a viable option in rural and remote areas also? Can, in fact, uh, Modhera's uh, model of 100% solar energy village be replicated in other parts of the country and even the world? How big an achievement is Modhera for us? You see, this is a very important question because the downside of solar energy has been that it can light a bulb, 
but it cannot run a refrigerator efficiently for long. An air conditioner, no. A small machine by the village carpenter, no. So you are not, development cannot be seen in terms of replacing a kerosene lamp with a light bulb, but you need something more. You need fans, you need refrigerators, you need air conditioning, you need a higher quality of life to bring the rural population somewhat at level with the urban population. So you need grid supply. That was the accepted wisdom so far. Then came the concept of mini grids, like in Mudhera, that there will be a big capacity solar plant and there will be a higher capacity battery storage. Now, Mudhera has something like 6 kVA of solar and 18 kVA of battery storage. A battery helps not only in providing power at night, but also gives you more power where you can run some of these items. You will not be able to run a steel mill or a big factory or even a smallish factory. But at least for the villagers' daily needs, population's needs, sufficient needs, sufficient well-being can be provided. Now, this model is important because there have been examples abroad and in other parts of the country too of the world, but the way it has been done here in a more organized, in a more well thought, thought out model is not only an example for the upcoming treaty-based conference of the International Solar Alliance, but the research, the, study, the data that will emerge from this, the practical experience that will emerge from this will become an important source for developing new models by the International Solar Alliance to be sent to countries like Africa and other parts. So it's not just a theoretical or a research model that will come out or a paper, but people can see in person. Linking it up with tourism as a sun temple is important, both in terms of the vision. You remember that the sun temple was established by the Chalukya something like a thousand years ago. It is almost on the topic of cancer. It has some significance with the movement of the sun. It is not only cultural, symbolic, but the idea itself that linking it up with tourism means that it, there will be pressure to make the model work. If there will be pressure to make sure electricity flows in this model, the maintenance, the other aspects are taken into account, and the village population benefits also from the tourism. So I think this combination of just, just the technology, updated technology, but also the way the technology is being used is an important model for other countries that just don't electrify a village, link it up with some activity, which provides both the incentive and the pressure to keep it running, the kind of pressure or incentive which households themselves cannot provide. I think the inauguration just before the Solar Alliance meeting is significant, and very important, because India had established this international solar alliance. And now India is showing the delegates and others that look, we have not just a broad vision of how the energy transition could take place in a large part of the world, but we are also going to the next step of looking at practical models that can be scaled up and that can be adapted by others. So what have been the major challenges in uh, sourcing uh, good quality solar plant equipment conforming to Indian standards? Are we aiming for self-sufficiency in this sector also? Yes. You know, the panel itself is silicon wafers, what we can broadly call, uh, not chips in the, in the computer sense, but they are silicon wafers which we are manufacturing. Now, once, and we have abundant sunshine, just as a lot of Africa has, a lot of tropical countries have, island countries. So once the vision of Atman Nirbhar Bharat is implemented, in the way the Prime Minister has conceptualized or thought about it, I look for these kind of energy transitions, for example, which is taking place in a large scale across the country and the world. India could be the hub, the manufacturing hub and the research hub. Because for solar panels, the technology is not very complex. The other component is inverters. And inverters are getting smarter. Smarter inverters will help have a ready market outside the solar villages, but also in urban areas. Of course, as grid supply improves, inverters lose their significance, but then inverters are getting smarter and you need smarter inverters here. You'll also be able to connect it to the grid. That is also an idea of the solar alliance. One world, one sun, one grid. Then just as rooftop solar panels are connected to the grid, I know of a person in the NCR, in one of the colonies here, set up a solar panel 
and he is, has paid no electricity bill over the last eight months, running to air condition. The concept works, not just because there is the storage and battery capacity, but also being connected to the grid, because they then supply the electricity back to the grid. We must remember that India, 25% of electricity is consumed by households. It's much more than the West. And as we urbanize, our consumption will go up. But as we urbanize, we will also have more rooftops. That is why part of the vision of the world, and particularly in India, is that somewhere around half of solar energy should be from what they call utility-scale power plants. That is, huge power plants of the kind that are being set up in Rajasthan, for example. 10,000 megawatts. 65,000 crores. That has been announced by Mr. Adani. Others have also been thinking of this. So we... Half of it, a little less than half, will be from rooftops. Now, if that demand can be met, then a lot of the leakage and wasted electricity that takes place through long rural grids will not be there as well. So the electricity distribution company will benefit because there will be less theft, because energy will not be siphoned out of the system, but actually be flowing back into the system. So I think this concept itself of, of the prime minister who has added a social dimension to the energy transformation, the West thought of energy transformation because of the problem they had created of climate change and they wanted to phase out fossil fuels. Prime Minister Modi's vision is slightly different. He is saying, we first of all, we need to give accessible and equitable and affordable power to our population. And then we need to think of the energy transition. So when the priority is the population or human well-being, the entire conceptual framework reverses in a sense. And then instead of supplying grid power throughout the country, you link that up with domestic energy flowing out of solar energy, linked with grid okay, for higher capacity equipment and to flow back into the system. So the entire concept of the electricity grid that was set up earlier by the West again to meet the urban demand and the way they were looking at the energy transition has been in some senses reversed by the prime minister of putting human well-being up front and taking advantage of the solar energy that is available to the country and taking advantage of the energy transition which has become to be a technology transformation where the cost of solar energy is dropping hugely. So, when sir, in this the... wholesome approach of the government, apart from solar energy, what are the forms of uh, renewable energy you see have the potential to help this energy transformation in the country? Ultimately, we need to be location-specific and respond to what nature has given to us. Solar energy or renewable energy is actually using nature. So, the potential for wind energy is not as much in tropical countries as it is in temperate countries. Then the other element is Hydroelectric energy. Hydroelectric dams have a downside of storage capacity inundating large sections of uh, some sections of the population. Local environmental problems can be caused. But the advantage of the hydroelectric is that if, if you, there is a peak demand, you can sw- switch it on very quickly and uh, meet that demand, which is also needed in, in, to stabilize the grid. That is what coal fired power plants are being used for at this point of time. But if we phase out coal, then you need hydroelectric storage capacity or you need nuclear energy. Now here there is a different debate. There is local pollution in with the hydroelectric environmental problems. And then nuclear is not so much the danger of an explosion, but the, but the issue of dealing with nuclear waste. When we look at it in a broader perspective, we find that we can develop our energy in a more balanced manner. Of course, it will take time. So the sunshine countries between Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, the Surya Putras, as Prime Minister Narendra Modi called them, have a special advantage, which initiatives like International Solar Alliance aim to use to bring low-cost, low-carbon footprint and sustainable solar energy to all. Thank you so much, uh, Mukulji, for this discussion. You were listening to a discussion on India Solar Capacity, Milestones and Challenges. The participants were... Mukul Sawal, environmentalist, and Sonu Sood, AIR correspondent. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.